Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for the rest of the session, we're going to ignore you, except for maybe the last 10 minutes where we'd love to throw it out to, to the audience and, and have a Q&A. But for the next 50 minutes, certainly amongst my peers and colleagues, we're going to have a discussion about how CEOs predict the future. So as with any meeting, and, and for some of us, it's the first time that we've met, uh, if we can quickly go around the table, do, do quick introductions, uh, and then it's worth me throwing out perhaps the first question, uh, and then we can begin from there. Uh, I'll start myself, and then, because I'm the least important person in the room, my name is Dino Murky, Chief Executive Officer of GEMS Education. Uh, my family is in education, specifically within K-12, to which are schools that cater to children from the age of three years old to 18 years old. Uh, we cut across 14 countries from around the world. And we believe we have this incredible responsibility to try and address and solve what we believe is the greatest challenge. Solve education, we solve everything else. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. My name is Cristiano Camara. I'm from Brazil. I'm a board member and former CEO and president of a media family business in Brazil. I'm a third generation. I'm now on the board. And I'm here representing our family foundation, who also focuses on education and creating education programs, technologies that can be then uh, forward to public systems. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Hilberati. I'm chief executive of London Stock Exchange PLC, um, an institution that's been around for 300 years. And the core to what we do is trying to make sure that businesses of all sizes that are innovating can get access to finance. Hi, I'm Amlan Roy. I'm a researcher who travels the world advising governments, institutions on investments, health, education, and pensions. I work for State Street Global Advisors, the third largest asset manager in the world, and also the largest custody trust bank in the world, and the second oldest US bank. Hi, everybody. I'm John Hall. I'm the Global Chief Growth Officer for Eastman Kodak Worldwide, a company many of you are familiar with, and we'll talk a bit more about that over the next uh, few uh, few minutes. I'm formerly a Blackstone guy, so very, very well versed in the private equity space, and I'm the guy that's been charged with fixing Kodak and pointing it back in the right direction. So the classic Harvard Business School case study that we can talk to. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and Sean Carolyn, uh, you guys have been doing amazing work at Gems, so, so I really appreciate being here. The, uh, I grew up in Chicago, was trained as a software and electrical engineer, uh, moved out to Silicon Valley and, and joined Menlo Ventures, and I've been a partner there for the last 16 years. So I focus on consumer. The firm does enterprise and consumer. Uh, some of my better known investments were Uber, uh, Roku, and Siri. Excellent. Well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, first and foremost, it's I'm, I'm very tempted to, to, to ask Armin because you perhaps have the broadest overview of, of some of the macro trends that we're perhaps facing. Um, when you look at the future, uh, what do you forecast? I mean, what's, what are the potential scenarios that you see as heading down? And, and when you advise your institution, what are some of the, the bets that you guys are making or some of the changes that you're, or you're conceiving of? Great question, Varki. I started off my career teaching derivatives in the United States. And what I will share is what I've learned about how we as economists have got models wrong, have got predictions wrong, have got lots of other things wrong. But following on from Mr. Al Gore, I would like to say that there's a much bigger financial crisis rather than just climate change crisis that we are ignoring around the world. So I want to share what the biggest management guru of 20th century said. His name is Peter Drucker. He's also called the biggest management uh, pensions guru of 20th century. In a book, he said, demographics is the single most important factor that we do not pay attention to. But when we do pay attention, we miss the point. <laughs> so I'm a demographics researcher. I claim the whole world misses very significant points and assumes it's about aging. And we either say it's about young or old. To me, demographics is about five point. 7.58 billion people on planet Earth from age zero to age 113.9, the oldest woman in Okinawa, Japan. But demographics is about people characteristics. That's where I'm in the same camp as him. 
Look at how he's dressed. I would love to dress like that. That's what I do when I'm running my marathons or uh, half marathons. And that's not my traditional attire. We've changed, yet all the economic and policy models that we use are based in the 60s and 70s. So the first big challenge I give the whole world is the fastest growing age group in the world is 80 plus. They are growing at four times the rate of the total population. And the 80 plus cost governments 80% to 140% more than an average 65 year old. How do we square the circle? The second challenge is, I'm called Mr. Unsustainable Promises around the world for predicting Greece will go bankrupt. I cheated from Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker in 1976 predicted GM Chrysler Ford will go bankrupt. No one listened to him. No one listened to me either in 2006. Predicted in the European Commission that Greece would go bankrupt. Now they want to know how to go. Why? Because everyone talks about climate change. Do you know where Nikhil's money goes or any European citizen's money goes? If you pay 100 euros or 100 pounds of taxes, 79.8% in the G20 goes on three components, which takes away from why the Bharti Foundation, Pratham, and all these people are doing great work. They go on pensions, health care, and old long-term care. It's unsustainable with 22% of European GDP going. We are fiscally bankrupt. How do we deal with these challenges? And you can't solve the pensions problem or the education problem by itself. Uh, my last sentence is advice to Asian and African governments. Do not make the mistake that the Western world made of long-term promises on pensions or healthcare. Look how smart we are. We can't even predict inflation or taxes for three months ahead or GDP growth, yet we are making promises 40 years in the future. So we are s stealing the future from the young people and diverting it towards the richest age group in the world in G20, which is 65 to 74 year olds old. I think we need holistic solutions for education, health, social policy, as well as infrastructure and tech across five generations. John, if I can move to you, thank you. So John, you already referenced the fact that you represent a, a firm and institution that is the classic case study of perhaps uh, inadequately forecasting what the future may hold. Yeah. So having stepped into your role, when you look back, what were some of the key things that perhaps Kodak missed and what are some of the things that you as the chief growth officer are putting in place to try and address uh, this very uncertain or, or very new future for the institution? The great question, Dino. Um, if you take it back, you had the original pioneer, the original Steve Jobs in George Eastman. True visionary, invented the camera, invented x-ray film, a whole variety of genius moments, the Kodak moment. It was the original marketeer as well. You push the button, we do the rest. Um, if you track it back and follow the chronology, we invented the digital camera. And this is, this is the Kodak moment. We invented it, we, we were going to bring it to market, and we decided not. And the reason why is we were producing 14.6 billion linear feet of film per year, 80 cents per linear foot with a 60% margin. So why would you disrupt that cash machine? It's an absolute cash cat. Um, the second problem is the world revolved around Rochester, New York. Kodak was this very US-centric, upstate New York-centric organization where it didn't listen to a whole variety of of global touch points. So yes, it's a global company, but didn't think in terms of the local markets and really didn't listen to what was required. Um, various other mistakes that Kodak made, there was a certain little startup called GoPro that mm -hmm. came to us that wanted us to um, invest in them and we said, no thanks, we don't think you're gonna make it. Mm -hmm. They've now got a market cap that's about 30 <coughs> times bigger than ours. Um, we have then looked very deeply at how do we fix this iconic brand. It's a brand that many people grew up with and knew and have got associations. Two core brand values that still stick within our company are trust and love. You trusted Kodak to pop your little film in the envelope, sent it off to the processing, and we sent you back your moments that you absolutely loved of your, your family or your wedding or friends or whatever it might be. We've looked back um, to really the, the core of the business of what George Eastman built the business on. And the core brand value is the science to create. So we've looked at 
the, the inventions, what have we done, how did we do it, what did we do right. Um, we pulled back the Kodak K-Bug, the, so the, the iconic Kodak logo that for some reason some bright spark in marketing decided to kill it off about 20 years ago. So you bring that back. We've then ridden and are riding this retro cool vinyl kind of moment. So one of our businesses is motion picture film. We are still lucky that the iconic directors, Nolan, Spielberg, Lucas, Mendez, Abrahams, Tarantino, will only ever shoot film on film. There's a certain look, there's a certain feel, there's a certain aesthetic. Our business cars are from that same polymer substrate that we use to, to do that. They literally, Tarantino went as far to say, if you guys stop making film, I'll stop making films. Mm. So we have this wonderful halo effect on, on a lot of the business. The second part is we've come back to the core roots to kind of take certain parts of our business and bring them back. So we've brought back the Super 8 camera. Everybody grew up with a Super 8 or certain types of cameras, and we, we brought that back, and that's coming back to market. We brought back the instant camera. So everybody's all very quick and keen with their, their phones and taking digital photos, but this is, this is coming back to the core roots of photography, of how you, you create, and you don't just point and shoot and take the, the best shot from the 500 photos you've just taken. You're very careful about what you do. Equally, we're trying to be disruptive in new technologies, so we've jumped on the cryptocurrency bandwagon. Okay. So we, we've developed a platform whereby Dino Varki takes a photo here in this room, um, puts it online. It's such an iconic shot of the six guys sitting around the table that it's used yeah. as the boardroom <laughs> shot, and you lose track of that, but we've got a timestamp model where we'll literally stamp that. It's your photo. We can trace that back around the world, and then you're compensated using cryptocurrency. So the, the impact on our business when we announce that deal is, is everybody's dream. We quadrupled the share price overnight. So I mean, it's a, a massive impact. We're also looking at an initial coin offering. So yes, we have got this cool retro business that we've gone back to our roots, where we, we did make big mistakes, but we've recognized a lot of those. Two very bad CEOs prior to the current one. But equally looking towards the, the sure. future, we're cryptocurrency and a variety of other technologies that fall into that space. So I was very tempted to go towards Sean, but I heard cryptocurrency, I heard ICOs, and I'm naturally gravitating this way towards <laughs> Nickel because <laughs> you're the CEO of the LSE and uh, that has an incredible role to play in terms of sort of driving sort of a global pool of capital into innovative companies and you continue to look at supporting innovative companies. What's the LSE's future when you're starting to see this almost um, parallel paradigm and ecosystem developing and you know there are people on either side I don't understand it so I am wary of it but how do you as as, as uh, in your position how, how do you look at that ecosystem and developing and, and how do you address that yeah I think that's a really really good question I think um, when I look at the big macro trends um, I think big thing affecting us is the extraordinary pace with which capital flow and stock is moving towards emerging markets. Mm. So um, we heard about demographics, we heard about uh, technological change. I think those, those are also driving changes in um, where wealth is um, around the world. And also the types of company um, that will be uh, coming to raise capital globally. Um, many more companies from economies where the state plays a stronger role in directing those, those companies than has traditionally been the case. Um, to give you um, some examples, um, on their biggest day in history, the Chinese exchanges together um, have traded $1 trillion of securities in one day. Right. Um, uh, and that is um, compared to, say, 50, 60 billion in Europe, a hundred, couple hundred billion in the US. So adding together all the other markets. And that is individuals uh, trading those securities. So I think that's one very, very big trend. Um, China, even if it grows at 5% a year, in five years, will add an economy the size of Germany to its GDP. Um, and then, then overlay that with technological change. And FinTech, hugely exciting, potential to disrupt businesses. What's very interesting about FinTech, particularly in the banking sector, is how with very quickly and with scale, they can uh, seek to capture the highest value added bits of the value chain that, that, that banks have, payments and, and other things. So that's for all of us, and we talk about ICOs, that's for all of us a, something that we have to think about. Um, what, what could that mean in, this, in the context of the global 
uh, capital markets. So if I take just one example, um, when, we, when I say I trade with you um, today, uh, our trade will settle in two days' time, typically. Right? And your cash will come to me, and then I'll, I'll give you the security. Um, a blockchain has the potential to make that instantaneous. So someone in China can trade with someone in Brazil, and it can happen instantaneously. And all those hundreds of billions of dollars of cash and securities that move around the world in those two days just, just disappear. And that has um, potentially quite dramatic um, impacts for uh, capital markets and businesses like ours. But what does that mean for us? It means that we have to um, embrace technology. It means that we have to think about it not just as an uh, uh, internal R&D spend, but actually be very agile in thinking about partnerships, because it's through partnerships that we will, um, uh, we will, we will le leverage this most effectively. But the one thing that, is, uh, that is you have to be aware, aware of, and it also applies to the ICO question, is that ultimately public markets are there because they're well regulated. Um, and that's not regulated as a barrier to entry, but it's regulation to ensure that you can trust who you're interacting with. Um, and we can only move as quickly as the regulatory community moves globally to shift to new paradigms and new ecosystems. So ICOs have started to develop, but at the moment they are quite, well, the, the numbers sometimes seem very dramatic, they're actually quite a small part of the overall um, ecosystem. Um, and it's hard to see that everybody globally really trusts digital tokens as the means by which they're going to transact. Yeah. Putting my hand up, to yeah. like I said. <laughs> uh, Christiana, just, just again, uh, given that you represent kind of the media sector, and obviously I know you're, you're obviously here in, in the context of a family foundation, when you think about media, and, and media certainly has seen significant disruption, disruption. and continues Absolutely. to, and, and actually so much so that you almost see from a commercial perspective, media and media provision being taken to the extremes in terms of how they present positions and stories to, to the people that watch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's driving people to an incredible extreme. I mean, what's your view about the future for media and, and you know, its place and actually within that, just, just tell me as somebody that consumes a lot of media, can we ever get back to a position where it's almost normalized. There's, a, there's that, that level of objectivity and integrity that comes back into the way that media presents what we see around in the world. And that's a great question. Uh, I think a little bit of context is necessary on the different kinds of media, not in different kinds, meaning radio, TV, newspaper, internet, but the, the different kinds of approaches companies have towards how they inform their public. So there are different kinds of media in the UK, in the US, in Brazil, in Asia, Africa. So uh, from a family perspective, uh, our approach to media is to serve the society. And that's uh, what we've been doing for three generations. So within this context, yes, we've been as disrupted as digital photography yeah. has been. And we've been striving to not only survive, but conduct our mission in the same way that we conducted that as my grandfather in 1930s or my father uh, up until recently before I took over the company. So uh, the fundamental question that we're asking here, how do we predict the future? I don't have that answer, as Alan said. Uh, it's very hard to predict. We don't, can, cannot even predict some figures that should be uh, nowadays very easy to do. Uh, but there's a, 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 a disruption comes change, and that's I, what I have been doing in my family business. I was a change agent for a long time, and uh, it was very hard to do change. So I went on to study it. So now I'm at uh, on a, on a master degree in INSEAD, studying how to produce change, but through uh, not a quantitative approach, but through a, a humanistic approach, and that's my answer for, uh, for, or actually maybe a question for the today's panel. Uh, I looked for something that was not DCF model. I looked for something that was much more humane approach. And within that, values to me are the most important thing. But the problem is, uh, how can we apply those values in predictions? Since probably in right now, we're not doing the predictions anymore, AI predicting everything for us. But how do we include values? How do we include the ethics that my business and my family have been putting 
on, uh, on the business for so long, how do we put in there so the outcome will better serve us? So that's part answer, part question. And uh, uh, the, the problem is we won't compete with AI in figures ever, not, not ever anymore. But what is the fundamental uh, element that we can provide that will put these predictions in the serve of society, in the service of society? We're all going to go into deep thought now because it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. I don't know. I mean, look, um, I'm going to get to Sean, but just given that this is a conversation, I think um, you know, we represent a sector that, that honestly, um, even at its very best, is still not fit for purpose for the future that we know is out there. Right? Even if you can judge the specifics, you can judge um, that sense of where we need to be. And, and that's usually frustrating for us. Um, and frankly, I've come to the realization that are we truly going to be dependent on our sector, which is the slowest to change and has been the slowest to be disrupted, to frankly build the knowledge generation, the knowledge economy, the capability in young people that's actually going to solve the problems of the future. So more and more, I'm of the opinion that, and it's been said a few times, I think, uh, Teachers will need to inspire, they will need to model, they will need to nurture humanity. Yeah. Uh, because we cannot be dependent on necessarily educators and education to be current with how rapidly things are changing. I mean, that's, that's certainly clear. I mean, we're going to have to be much more dependent on industry and you know, the kinds of companies that, that Sean has invested in to kind of get a sense of, okay, what's really happening? Uh, and more and more, so going back to your point, you know, when I think about what great schools should do, what great teachers should do, what great educators should do, it's almost as if you're saying, you need to give our young people a framework, a framework within which they can make, well, a framework where they can try and make the right choices, right? And right choices could be different for different people, but can you give them a framework to kind of interpret just all of this change and kind of go, Okay, am I doing the right thing? So my family sort of invested um, in the last sort of fundraising round of Singularity University. Um, again, some, some or many people around the table and around the room will know it. And one of the stories that I remember them telling me, and I may embellish it a little bit, but it was so there was this global university challenge and there were teams of people that had different entries. The winning entry was this team of um, uh, young people that had been that had essentially grown a cat that can glow in the dark. I don't know if you know the story. Mm -hmm. So this cat, turn the lights off, would glow. And the point there was, it's, an in it's incredible, but just because you can grow a glow in the dark cat, should <laughs> you grow a glow in the dark cat? A and that's kind of sat with me, which is around there is a framework where people need to be able to make the right choices because there are going to be really hard choices. It is about values. It is about ethics. Uh, there is this foundation around just continuing to learn. But as you learn, what sources do you use to learn from? And that's where I think there is so much out there and so much of it drive people to, again, I feel towards certain biases or certain extremes where it's very easy to, to get them to, to perhaps go down a particular pathway where they should be looking at something else. Uh, so not an answer, but yeah. just, just a viewpoint. And that's a viewpoint. how values apply again yeah. when you think about education and you think about bringing up young children to a world where you can create maybe much more dangerous things than a, a, a glowing cat in the dark. I, I use my example how do you, very carefully. <laughs> yes, exactly. How do you uh, uh, manage to, to, uh, to teach them the critical thinking and values sure. that will provide, abide them from, you know, doing more harmful things than, a, Potentially. than the example we just used. <coughs> so let me move to Sean because, yeah. you know, we're all in very different sectors, fundamentally disrupted spaces, notoriously slow to, to change sectors, uh, another sector that's been disrupted. You're in the business of investing in the future and investing in companies that are trying to make a pathway in the future. I mean, how, how do you view it? I mean, when you go out and, and, and make a bet on a, on a team or an idea or a concept, what's the framework that you use to, to figure out whether 
this is something that will be of value and that can build scale and capacity and impact. Uh, I hope I, I'm not disappointing, but it's actually quite simple. There you go. Uh, and that is, I think, of taking on the role of an anthropologist. And you can, you can see, you, know, you observe humanity, and you see where are people spending their, their time or where are they spending their money. Mm -hmm. And then we think of what I say is uh, ingredient technologies or the, is these individual pieces, you know, the cloud, internet, mobile phone, uh, AI, machine vision, lithium ion batteries, IoT, like all of these ingredient technologies are just pieces. And I think the smart entrepreneurs take those pieces and, and piece them together and then solve one of those needs. So generally speaking, humans have not evolved that much in several millennia. And so you say, I need shelter, I need food, I need clothing, entertainment, uh, affection, et cetera. And then uh, can, I, can the technologist deliver that in a better way? So to use Uber as my recent favorite example, we led the B round, I'm here and I need to get over there and it's farther than I want to walk. Like that's a, that need has been around for many years and, and the old way of doing that was walking to the corner and putting your hand up and it kind of stunk. You waited 15 minutes and it was a non-deterministic uh, amount of time that you would wait, you would be into a junkie car uh, and, and then Uber came along and it was better, faster and cheaper for that exact same use case. And so you say, well, it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out that like people are gonna prefer this instead of this. So uh, I think the, the harder part is maybe seeing ahead of it being in the market and being able to see are people liking it? Because there's a lot of nuance to whether or not uh, consumers will do that. We've talked about education. Sure. The best education, frankly, is still a human who knows everything about the subject I wanna learn about and can have a conversation with me. It's mm -hmm. very efficient, the master teachers, the, empathy, you know, a human face sure. and keeps you very engaged so you don't get bored and mm -hmm. click off to the next YouTube video. And until the technologies can, can replicate that type of experience, then teachers are going to be essential, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, is, there a, is there a contradiction sometimes between what within your sector you know, you know that that's where it's heading to, that's the future? versus where the market is. And I'll, I'll, I'll use our sector as an example. Um, you know, we were looking at the UK, we really wanted to figure out how we could deliver a much higher quality of education than the current public system in the UK delivers, but can we really bring the cost of education down? And we had the model. Uh, we could deliver in the UK where the spend per student is about nine, 10,000 uh, pounds. We believe that we could deliver a higher quality of education, evidence externally for about three to 4,000 pounds. 3,000 pounds, so four and a half, five thousand dollars. The model was really very simple. It just meant that, you know, a great teacher, and these would be truly exceptional teachers through the power of technology would, rather than going out to 25 kids, would go out to 100 kids. And then you had younger teacher practitioners who may not be qualified teachers, but frankly as 19 year olds are on their way to Oxford or Harvard or Cambridge are actually better practitioners of the subject, supporting smaller cohorts of 15 kids, 10 kids. The numbers work. So we're comfortable the model works. Could I get a parent, and we did this eight years ago, 10 years ago, could I get a parent to buy that? Absolutely not. Because if I told them that their children were gonna spend most of their time with really able, of course, 18 or 19 year olds, they go, um, no. Mm. And actually as a result, that model is a model f for marginalized children. Yeah. Children mm. that have different needs or <laughs> can't access mainstream education. So do you guys figure, face that kind of challenge where you kind of know, well, this is where the future of your sector is and you know you need to innovate, but yeah. that's not where the market is? And how do you bridge that gap? I think, that, I think that, that experience is not dissimilar to, say, financial services, where you have these fintechs um, developing, seeking to innovate, reshape customer experiences, um, but actually in developed markets, they've really struggled to gain mass market appeal, um, and increasingly you're seeing them partner with incumbents. But this, where you, this is where I think the, the scale of change emerging in emerging markets combined with technological change becomes interesting. Because where fintechs have um, had huge impact is in emerging markets. Alipay, 150 million mm -hmm. users of payment services. Mobile payments in Kenya, for example, Absolutely. delivering an unmet financial services need. 18 million people using that, completely leapfrogging the, the form of payments 
um, that we use in, in, in Western markets. So um, I think that uh, the, the combination of technological innovation and rapid uh, economic development in those markets is what will be the, what will be the, the ultimate disruptor for traditional businesses. And I've heard the view leapfrog a couple of times, actually, um, and it would be great to get your thoughts, but it is interesting that emerging markets, because they've had an absence of a traditional social welfare system, they don't have these legacy systems, you seem to have had greater innovation, more highly pay. I mean, our sector in this part of the world, there's a, you know, I tell people that the UAE is a 90% private sector K-12 education market. The penetration of public sector is 10%. Uh, and actually, if you were only to look at a cross-section of the private sector schools here, they're already significantly ahead and put the UAE already at its 2021 target of being amongst the top, top 15, top 20 nations in the world. But it, you're right, it, there does seem to be this mature market legacy of unwinding these systems. I'd like to say something on emerging markets because having worked on emerging markets crises for 37 years, I want to share something. The IMF World Economic Outlook says the world growth over the next five years will be 4.1%. 73% of that growth is supposed to come from emerging markets. Every emerging markets, and I just go to about 34 to 35 emerging markets countries a year, every leader in China, India, Brazil, Mexico, um, or Peru and Chile end up saying that, oh, demographics, we have a lot of young people, and that's the solution. I give an example, and I want everyone in the world to look at I'm just a geeky researcher carrying the biggest, heaviest bag in this 1,000 uh, or 2,000 people conference, uh, is that Latin America did not get the demographic dividend in the 80s and 90s, but Asia did. And those are countries such as Taiwan, Korea, etc. So just having young people is not a solution for India, as I said in this room or in another room yesterday, 400 million young Indians, 600 million young Chinese is not a demographic solution because the biggest problem today in the world is youth unemployment in the three most unequal countries in the world. Number one unequal country of the world, Brazil. Number two, India. Number three, China. And when you look at that against technology, it brings me back to my debate with Eric Brynolfsson and McAfee, who've written the best book on technology, advised the US president, Race Against the Machine. And Eric Brynolfsson tells General Colin Powell and me that yes, 80% of your jobs will be done by robots. I said, how do you square the circle with so much youth unemployment in the world and robots? And I think where robots are really helping us is understand how we as human beings are not perfect. And Herbert Simon said it in the 70s that we are not going to be perfect, but robots are helping us understand how given the same gamble, I behave very, very differently than John or than him or than Dino. And that's important to understand inefficiencies of human behavior. And values come in. People say economists don't criticize each other. Please do go and read a book very easily written. My even 13-year-old daughter is trying to read it. It's called Animal Spirits by two of the Nobel Prize winning economists, Mr. Janet Yellen, called George Akerlof, and Robert Schiller on why economics failed in last 50 during this crisis. It ignored what he said, corruption, greed, money illusion, integrity, all those things we ignored because in all the finance models we said, if the bank Fed increases interest rates, what's the effect on the average American? Who's the average American? He or he? Who's the average global citizen? We are very different. And models fail because we simplify. It's better to understand from him what the humanistic solutions are and they are understanding consumers and workers, which I think is very important. Behavior is important. Just even a teacher today is so different. And I've been taught and I still learn from people who are Nobel laureates working 17 hours a day. Puts investment banking average workers to shame. And I'm in that sector where we think, oh, we are not paid enough because one year the bonus wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do think we need to morally question in terms of what Adam Smith said, theory of moral sentiments. We want to grow capitalistically, but have a moral sentiment. Education is central to that. No, I mean. Has the role of the CEO changed in this rapidly changing world? I mean, what is the, you know, Sean, and you're probably, again, on, on in, at the forefront of this. I mean, have you, have you changed the way that you look at opportunities? Or is it still that same simple principle? I mean, it's a simple principle, but the, the methodology for selecting has changed dramatically. 
and, and I think it dovetails back with the question that you had asked is, hey, I have this great model and I'm gonna 4X the cost structure. Uh, you know, that's you thinking and your management team sees it. The biggest change is actually how can we uh, understand what the, the consumer wants in very high fidelity, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so for example, in that case, I pay a lot for our kids' education and it's worth every penny. If you tell me I have to make one sacrifice in quality to save a dollar, I don't want it. But you know, there's a different part of the market that would want that, but you, you learn that through consumer research. Well, the beautiful part uh, about technology innovations now, uh, we call it internally the hacker, the hustler, and the designer. A three-person team <laughs> can launch a app into the app store, throw up a website, start interviewing customers, whatever, and, and figure out like within an hour of it being in the app store, how is this working? Okay, by the way, somebody get that down. That was the how-to guide, hacker, hustler, designer, an hour. <laughs> right, for high, very high. After you, <laughs> you high, very high it. degree After of fidelity, launch. consumer feedback, that's definitely gonna be my how-to principle that I'm gonna <laughs> take away. <laughs> but seriously, like, uh, you know, mixed panel, these analytics tools, you, you, you put it out there and, and then you see exactly, okay, which streams are being used, how many people come back the next day, and, and I don't care how smart you think you are, if you launch an app, and nobody comes back the next day, you have the wrong app. The market has spoken, and it's your job to go see, what did I miss? Did I have the need wrong? Maybe I had the need right, but there was like 10 screens they had to click through and they got bored and left. Like, it is your job as an innovator to get all of those frictions out of the way, and maybe it's a price point. I mean, it depends all on that value proposition, but if you deeply understand what they're trying to accomplish, we call it the job to be done, this is what they're trying to get done. They don't care about technology. This is what they're trying to get done in their lives. And they're gonna look around at all of the options for that. And if you can give them a better alternative to accomplish that job, then, uh, then they'll use it. And if they don't use it, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, uh, does that apply? I mean, are there similar principles that you guys would apply within your own context that, that you can draw upon? Oh, I, I would say that in, in, I, I'm still uh, young, but it changed so dramatically from when I began my, my entrepreneur career when I was 21 and I started my, my own internet company. And when I became a family business, a three generation family business CEO, it changed so dramatically in terms of how you spend your time looking into your own company, into your own operation, and how you spend your time following, understanding, and serving your customer base. Mm -hmm. So this is for dramatic effect, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 it's much more than a lifetime. Mm -hmm. it, it's several lifetimes in a 20 year period maybe, where, like you said, the, the speed of this answer, of this feedback is so dramatically huge mm -hmm. that you don't even have time to look at your own operation. So uh, when I came into the family business, for example, I used to spend time looking into the operation. But in the later years, I just couldn't do it. I had to rely on my team, and I had to look at every single stakeholder dynamics to understand if we were fulfilling our mission or not. And, and that is, it's not going bad. It's only increasing. I just, just reinforce that point. I think a CEO and board now um, spends a certain amount of time obviously looking internally, but actually one really key function is how you manage your partnership ecosystem. So all those partners outside, um, and to some extent, technology is forcing us to externalize innovation, to think about who in this sort of supermarket of uh, uh, tech collaborators we, we, we want to work with and how we're managing those relationships um, very strategically. And that's a real shift, I think, in traditional boardroom uh, executive management thinking. I think the second really big question for us, and this is where the links with your industry come in, Dino, is how do we ensure our people have the skills that are going to equip them for 10, 20 years? You know, we uh, not only would pre yeah, previously look at traditional business skills, but now coding, data science, all of those things become incredibly um, important, uh, not just in the operational bits of the business, uh, to be honest. They become, they're, they're important life skills that um, we need to think about how, how our teams are equipped to, uh, to, to learn. I mean, do you guys have a view, and again, I'll just after the table, so 
when we look at our sector, what is very, very clear, there is going to be increasing technology penetration. There are going to be increasing components of, of again, the, people say routine, but actually, I actually think there could be higher order things that, that, that an automated, okay, we talk about the adaptive learning engine and kind of as the holy grail in education, but effectively an AI driven learning engine that's able to kind of manage the, the student's journey. And again, hopefully then the teacher, one, because great teachers are a diminishing resource. I think you must have heard that, right? So to meet the new sustainable development goals, 69 million teachers is what we're going to be short of. So the reality and the fact is the great teachers are a diminishing resource. So those great teachers need to go out over greater numbers of students. It's an inevitability, and they'll need to do something, as I said, it's, that's going to be higher order. So in our sector, there is going to be a shift, right? There is going to be greater levels of automation. But given the shortage that we have, it isn't necessarily going to result, at least when we forecast it, in, in a traditional, very functional job crisis that many, many sectors are, are probably going through. I mean, do you have a sense, John, in your sector? I mean, are there higher levels of automation? I mean, what's the level of potential job loss or job retraining or scaling? Or what's the profile in, in your sector in terms of that change? Yeah, no, great question. So if you, if you look at different parts of our business, we've got... Uh, a billion dollar print business, which is, it's very automated. Um, you then go to things like film. The film factory, and we were gonna close this down, so this was a decision to not, to, to save a business. It's a highly skilled job with a certain type of executive that we've had to go and get people from retirement back into our business mm. that have got the skill and the know-how and the knowledge because we're actually now applying this material to a variety of other new technologies you can print sensors into this kind of material, so polymer that we're putting it on the front of racing cars, we're putting it on Ben Ainsley's sailing boat, Ben Ainsley's, ben Ainsley's uh, America's Cup boat, so you can get sensor data and telemetry from that. So we are, we're bringing in a whole new series of skill sets and people into the Kodak ecosystem. Again, you, you, you've got this 130-year-old company that built its core value on film that's certainly going down this cryptocurrency route. So again, there's a high, a uh, high amount of new recruits that are coming into the business. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned Alipay earlier on. We've got a big relationship with Alibaba where we developed their anti-counterfeiting software for them. Believe it or not, 53% of the things on there are fake. Um, so, you know, we, we're bringing wow. in this whole new group as, as well into Kodak that just didn't exist. So the old days of the film people with some printing people and a bit of packaging people, uh, 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 have kind of gone as we're bringing in this new talent. Um, we were the ones that linking this to education. We were the ones that set up the Rochester Institute of Technology. We set up the Eastman, Eastman School of Music. George Eastman was one of the original founders of MIT. So we, okay. we're looking further and further to do more with the major schools and colleges around the world and linking in with them to kind of bring in some of the talent. It's great everybody wants to go and work in Silicon Valley with the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, etc. But we're still retaining some talent and attracting talent that doesn't want to go down this sort of stereotype mm. route and wants to come to, to the Kodak world to look at what we can do and how they can develop their careers with us. Interesting. Um, I totally agree with what he's saying. I've, I've worked in three types of industries in education, which I still work at in... Um, as a university professor, but by side as an asset manager and investment banking. So let me give you three things which have changed. Universities in America, which have the best business programs, are shutting down MBA schools because many of them find they cannot sustain loss learning given that they have to pay professors so much. Mm -hmm. So a lot of online courses are happening. Then look at what LinkedIn, Salesforce, optimization have done to trading technologies. Big data, so I used to teach big data estimations earlier 20 years ago. Now I can do it in five minutes and still teach a course mm. on it because the data is available. As he said, you can show it more humanly, you can do more animation, etc. But there's still lots of ways to go because it's taking away lots of jobs from London and New York and putting it in Poland and Pune and Bangalore. And there are those kind of trade-offs that my industry faces and regulation is one big thing that we've not talked about. But I want to give a bit of a pushback to the conference. Sure. And here's my two cents worth. Seeing the world around, it should not be just what, how should we train young people for the world of 2030? How do you train a growing 
set of older people who in Japan and Korea and Finland are working into their 70s and 80s and transmitting skills. Don't tell me that your father can't still teach me heck of a lot and all over the world about education, even when he is 80 or 85 or 90. Agreed, so we should talk about live longer, work longer, learn longer, and share longer. I, right. Absolutely. So we're going to go out to Q&A, but just, just very quickly around the table. i um, going to ask the question, uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about our future? Just, just one word. Optimistic. Oh, you can contextualize it a little bit. So optimistic or pessimistic? Optimistic. Optimistic. John? I'm optimistic about the future. OK. I'm not? Optimistic. I'm going to be the only one that's different. OK. Optimistic. Christiana? I'm optimistic as long as we work with technology to reduce inequalities. I think that's a major point yeah, that, we, that we need to address. I mean, technology needs to be a force for good. And, and I mean, it's good that it creates more efficient processes, but it has to be to have a better outcome. You know how many drivers that Uber's put to work? Yeah, of course. Excellent. Yeah. LinkedIn. It's changed the world the way we recruit. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, universities are looking at LinkedIn all the time. Earlier, you would get all these uh, CVs. My firm, which is so, so ultra-conservative, Boston Bank, called State Street, now does a lot of hiring based on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm and HR departments are changing. So technology is forcing us to change, but the behavioral change is not identical across all six of us, even if we be Stanford PhDs. Absolutely. And I can tell you that having spoken to somebody who was Sergey Brin's PhD supervisor and Larry Page. That's, not bad. That's yeah. not bad. No longer alive. So here, here's my answer. I mean, look, I am optimistic. I need to be optimistic. I am hopeful. Sometimes, you know, you do feel worried. Uh, and, and we haven't talked about it, and perhaps it's another boardroom session, or it's perhaps uh, six of us kind of grabbing a coffee or another beverage later tonight. But uh, where I feel less hopeful, and it's one of the things that certainly we as a family believe is, is incredibly important, and it isn't just about education. It covers regulation, but it's about political will and leadership. And what we are seeing around the world today, you know, we always are incredibly happy when, you know, a President Clinton comes and... and uh, comes to the conference and gives us that sort of the, the ability to send the message of education across. We're incredibly grateful that uh, Vice President Al Gore comes and you know, President Sarkozy is coming. I don't know if that's meant to be a secret, but I don't think it is. So you've got a President Sarkozy, Prime Minister Blair. It's incredible, uh, the amount of stuff. And Madam Julia Giller, it's wonderful. But my challenge and our challenge, and, and sometimes where I feel a little bit more pessimistic and a little bit more cynical, is that it's great that former heads of state carry the cause of education. I'm, I'm, it's incredibly hopeful. But why is it not the same for a sitting head of state to carry this cause and many others? Mm. Education just happens to be one of them, uh, right? Everything is lip service. Uh, it, it feels as if uh, one of the things that we benefit from in our region in the UAE is, OK, we're not a democracy, but we've got incredibly ambitious leadership that is always, even before they were a country, have thought of the well-being of their people. And I don't feel that that is necessarily what we are seeing around the world. And, and while I get worried, I also know that if we look back in history, um, things sometimes get worse right before they get a little better. So that's where I return back to optimism. Um, thank you all. I'm not closing the session because there is an opportunity for Q&A. Um, any questions, guys? Yes. Oh, many. Ooh. OK. Uh, I, is there, I don't know if there is a mic. If there isn't, I'll just point around. There is a mic. Can we work through? Yes, let's go there. Let's go there. And I think there's a question back there somewhere. A question there as well. I have a question to you. When you said that uh, we need to you know, uh, let the people learn more for the retiring people. Now in a country like India, wherein we are not having the employment for the younger generation, and people are passing out, and when they are passing out, they are given offer letters, and then suddenly on the date of joining, it comes, one year later, please come. And this is company coming from companies like Wipro, Infosys, and DCS, who are the best of the best. So while I empathize for my father, who is also a great uh, industrialist, but then how do we marry the two? 
how can we live the family how do we survive in this economy in the country and outside in the world also great question for amlan right yeah it was from yes. <laughs> okay so having friends leading those countries tcs uh, infosys etc i think it's a big problem and i think in india the big problem is the same as in the world my generation has not thought about creating new jobs so when the financial crisis happened a lot of these three companies faced the problem of how do we reengineer if us and europe etc are slowing down so i do think that older people have a role to play in japan in korea in switzerland and norway etc and that's where i want to also partly address this question that where there are homogenous quick decision making countries with general welfare as paramount in norway sweden denmark finland singapore china china education is top if you look at his this thing i want to create 600 million consumers but in india part of the problem is also what i tell the prime minister's office and mr modi straight to his face that yes we first need drinking water we need food we need good electricity before we start getting educated i support two of the very poorest charities old people mr narayan murthy cannot take away the job of a 22 year old mr hashim prem ji cannot take away the job of a 23 year old please note there's a myth that old people take away young people's jobs mr clinton is not taking away a 22 year old who's working in target or home depot etc and there's academic research shown by the best think tank on pensions in america center for retirement research and expert researcher that actually that's not true old people in japan and finland are contributing by sharing things across generations they've seen crises when you look at investment banks now there is in goldman sachs and credit suisse a trading desk where no one's seen a rate rise before so what happens when there's the rate rise uh, then we will need to bring back some more of the bankers i hope i've answered a bit of your and i'd also say look we've got to take away the focus from big companies um the biggest job creators in most major economies are actually small and medium sized yeah. enterprises Absolutely. if you look at youth and youth unemployment in europe 23 million youth unemployed is approximately 23 million small and medium sized enterprises do the maths right if they will create one job each um so actually a huge focus of public policy and um the financial system should be how you can have a thriving ecosystem for the entrepreneurs for the small and medium sized enterprises i i think the uh, and actually we're seeing this across certainly in our part of the world financial institutions when it comes so there is a part of the economy within the ua does not generate its income or wealth in the ua i always talk to friends of mine that have been here for 25 30 years had their children here ones in mining is one of the largest emerging market miners in the world right one is the largest paper manufacturer and distributor they've never generated anything here and yet the financial institutions here will not lend to them even though that is such a part a large part of the economy here a higher risk profile i'm sure you can find structures that mitigate that risk so if if i had another life and had the skill set i'd be setting up an sme focused bank because the opportunity is in plain sight yeah. right so if any of our bankers are there i've told you this enough times <laughs> go out and do it right there was a question here yeah. and this is a question for you dino ah okay uh, you said the uh, sure, no questions for me education system is the slowest to to change so looks slowest to be disrupted uh my first question for example I've been for the last 10 years lobbying to uh, include emotional social and positive intelligence into the program. Sure. Instead of for, for example ge geography. I'm not saying geog geography is not important, but if somebody wants to get in, uh, more information about he can he can get it from the internet wherever. But emotional social and positive intelligence is very important for their future, sure. for our future. Mm -hmm. But how what you doing as an organization at the leading edge of change? Sure. and uh, to effectively make those uh, uh, those things i know you're doing I, i'm very very aware what you're doing but to make those changes more quick because we don't have time so there's a couple of things i would say to that first and foremost look we will pilot and incubate a whole bunch of things right so with singularity we worked up a co-curricular program the sad thing is it's co-curricular so not part of the core curriculum which actually gives the 10 global challenges eradicate poverty solve climate change solve education and then aligns the core structure 
around the problem. So kids pick a problem that they want to fix, and then everything else lines up underneath. But it's 10 weeks. Don't, I can't find space, because I run other people's national curricula, to fit this in. It's, it's shocking. But those young people, I mean, I'll give you the story. It's a great story. Do we have time? Yes, we do. So I went and saw, uh, we had a teacher awareness day in September. We had 1,500 new teachers. But within it, I saw a group of students, right? five boys. And these come from our for, one of our affordable schools, so $3,000 a year. So they were able to go to Silicon Valley because they were part of the finalists for the Grand Global Challenge. So they came up, and they go, sir, we have an idea for you to invest in. So immediately I hear that. These guys are 16, 17. So my frame of reference is slightly different. I said, OK, fine, right? I'm not happy and smiling. I'm saying, give me the pitch. They go, OK, uh, we're patenting a technology that can build a home for $100 in 20 minutes that's almost indestructible. That was the pitch. <laughs> so I go, OK, let's set up a meeting next week. Right? And, and we didn't give them that idea. But we created an environment that wasn't part of the core curriculum, but was this program that allowed them to dream and kind of nurture this idea. And now they're taking it to as practically possible. I mean, there are some economic challenges there, and there are some things they need to figure out. But what an idea. So that's one of the ways in which we're doing it. And the other way about moving it quickly, frankly, there's two ways. One, a gathering like this, initiatives like the Global Teacher Prize, what I said previously about trying to mobilize education and the need for change on, it, on the G20. That's really, really important. It is not on the main table. Trying to get sitting heads of states to stop paying lip service and actually do it for themselves. That's one way of doing it. But frankly, that's taking too long. At the end of the day, and Sean knows this through the companies that he's invested, we're not going to wait. Right? We will go out and do it because, frankly, the scale of the challenge is so significant. You need to go for whatever works. And if people choose to follow, great. Otherwise, we frankly don't have enough time. So that's our view, our view of, of what needs to happen. And then we're kind of pretty dog-headed about it. I'm going to go. I'm going to go here because there was a question there and a question there. Yeah. yeah Ma'am, please. Hi. Um, this is for you, Dino. Oh, I um. did ask. <laughs> ask my learned colleagues around. Okay. Right. You did mention about the. Um, lack of really inspiring teachers or the scarcity that great teachers are diminishing great resource teachers. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, have you had a little bit of a, a think tank and did a kind of a, a thought shift where um, you would employ people who haven't done the teaching curriculum and qualified as teachers but who in the corporate world are near their uh, kind of uh, uh, retirement, so to stage, but they have a lot to offer sure. and teach uh, uh, students in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, by the way, it isn't just across an aging profile. Because you've got fundamentally disrupted sectors, yeah. you, we've actually got a source of potential teachers. So telecoms, right? Hugely disrupted. But you've got some really able yeah. engineers yeah. and others. that The most important thing, so they have the skill sets and the traits and the technical know-how to be able to guide people. We're short of physics teachers and science teachers and math teachers, right? That's what the, you know, if you're looking at where the shortages are, absolutely, right? We would look at them. They just need to love teaching and love children. Right? As long as they love teaching and I'm love children. Say, I'm going to come to you afterwards. Oh, sure you will. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, as a result, what, one of the things that we realized is we need to grow our own. So we have the ability internally to be able to give uh, a, a person, no matter what their age, a teaching qualification. Uh, it's just one of the capabilities that we needed to develop. Again, being reliant on other people. Um, was just getting a little challenging. Also because we have a view of what teachers should be able to do, right? Whereas in a lot of countries, the basic teacher training qualification has not changed for 50 years. Yeah. Right? And that, again, is unacceptable. And that, again, is unacceptable. But universities are doing it, so why shouldn't yeah, schools? Exactly. exactly. Right? They use people like me a lot. Absolutely. So why not? Absolutely. Uh, question there. I know the gentleman has been waiting for some time. And we've got 50 seconds left. So this may be the last question. Apologies for those that didn't get a chance, but apologies. Very quickly, this is for the entire group. Um, I mean, one of the big uh, questions on my mind is about financing education right now. Um, in the US, um, you know, folks have done through taxes um, that have a lot of challenges because sometimes money is there, sometimes it's not. Um, philanthropists try to donate money, but that's not really sustainable. Have you heard of new financing models for education? Uh, specifically, you know, corporations do CS, they budget a certain amount of their profits for CSR. Specifically for education, would that be a realistic 
I'm going to address it, and then you guys can because it's quite. Uh, frankly, no, I don't think it's sustainable. Um, frankly, you need to encourage more private sector, direct private sector participation in education. And I know in the U.S. in mature markets, there are hugely entrenched views of private sector, nonprofit, public. We're the biggest supporters of public education in the world. But if they're failing our children, and there is going to be research that's out there, which I shouldn't share publicly, but you guys will get the number in terms of lost productivity and economic growth of failing education system. It's a staggering number. So until, and again, this is a regulation point, people start to get out of how they have regulated things or where they think their responsibility is, you're not necessarily going to get it. But it's a mature market problem versus an emerging market problem. In an emerging market scenario, you, like I said, you don't have the legacy systems. So leaders, politicians, <laughs> systems are much more willing to leapfrog. They don't care whether it's private sector that provides it as long as they're regulating the quality and the output. Yeah. They don't have these hang-ups, frankly. Sorry. There are two foundations in US. Please do follow them because they do very innovative financing. And they are led by two super stalwarts who you should invite to your conference. Really? One of the best speakers and best tennis players ever, Andre Agassi yeah. and General yeah. Colin Powell. Yeah. So good. if you reach out to them, you can say I referred. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everyone. Sean, John, Amlin, Nikhil, Cristiano. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.